Created by Jeb Stuart, season 1 of Vikings Valhalla took us back to the 11th century and showed us a land plagued by religious fanaticism. There were a few who knew that for Vikings to flourish, it was imperative that they stay unified. But then there were zealots who were ready to go to any extent in the name of religion. With Vikings Valhalla season 3 coming on Thursday, let's take a quick look at what all transpired in the first and second season and how the power dynamic stands as of now. A spoiler warning ahead as we will be discussing essential plot points and character details from the show. If you've watched it already, let's dive straight into the video. And while you're at it, please like the video and subscribe to our channel as it helps us a lot. Vikings plan an attack on King Ethelred. During the 11th century, the mighty warrior clan, the Vikings, had settled all over England. It felt like the golden era where the Norse legend Ragnar Lothbrok ruled the north and would once again return. More than a hundred years had passed since the Vikings had left their northern homelands, but the English had still not accepted them as their own. There was a deep-rooted resentment in the Anglo-Saxon cultural group, and they wanted their king, Ethelred II, to do something about the Viking problem. It was the night of St. Bryce's Day, and the Vikings were celebrating this auspicious event when they got to know that the King's Guard had been summoned by King Ethelred. Sten, the elder brother of Harald Sigurdsson, was the leader of the King's Guard, and he was naive enough to believe that the people of England took them as their own. The King ordered the extermination of the entire Viking clan living on the island. The members of the King's Guard were murdered in the dining hall of the King's Chamber, and the entire Danelaw was set ablaze by the English forces. King Ethelred didn't even leave the women and children, and the cries of the helpless and innocent reached the Danish shores. King Canute of Denmark decided that he would unite the Viking forces under one banner and take revenge on behalf of his brothers and sisters. The Vikings from all over the north were asked to assemble in Kattegat, but the Danish king didn't know that an anti-pagan sentiment was rotting the very foundation of his kingdom. The Greenlanders arrive at Kattegat. At first, when Leif Eriksson and his sister Freydis Eric's daughter arrived on the shores of Kattegat, people thought they had come to participate in the war against the English. Harald Sigurdsson was smitten by Freydis the moment he saw her. She reciprocated his feelings, and the two shared an intimate moment when Harald noticed a big scar on Freydis' back. Freydis then narrated to him what had happened in her past and why they had come to Kattegat in the first place. Many years ago, a so-called Christian Viking came to Freydis' house and found her all alone there and he raped her. The man carved a cross on Freydis' back, and while doing so, he told her that he was converting her to Christianity and washing away her sins. Though it is said that there is no competition in the kingdom of God, religions have always sought to gain power for the growth of their communities. Freydis' family believed in the old ways, which is why they were ostracized by extremists over the years. Harald's half-brother Olaf Haraldsson and Olaf's devout follower Gunnar Magnusson arrived at Kattegat because King Canute needed their expertise to win the war. Olaf and Gunnar had helped King Ethelred build his defences, which is why they knew exactly what their weaknesses and strengths were. Olaf was a zealot and he was ready to help King Canute on one condition. The king had to facilitate a mass conversion as he didn't want to fight alongside the pagans. Harald knew his half-brother Olaf well and he had realized that to break the deadlock between him and King Canute, he had to resort to some other way. Harald told Olaf that Canute would become a rich man after raiding the English Empire, and if Olaf decided to fight alongside him, then he could also reap the benefits. A reconciliation of sorts was reached, and Olaf agreed to assist King Canute in the battle. In Kattegat, Freydis recognized the perpetrator who had raped her, and it was none other than Gunnar. Freydis stabbed Gunnar and killed him in front of everybody. Olaf would have killed Freydis, but Estrid Hakun, the ruler of Kattegat, came in between. Later, Harald manipulated the situation and asked Estrid to allow Leif to repay the debt owed by his sister by fighting alongside Knut. And that's how the Greenlanders joined the battle. King Knut finally conquered England. Even before the war started, the news of King Ethelred's death reached King Knut. The Vikings decided that even though the actual perpetrator has died, somebody had to pay the price for his sins. Edmund, King Ethelred's young son, was crowned king, and Harald and the other Vikings decided to take him down. Capturing England was very important for King Canute, as he had always harbored the desire to sit on the throne in London. With the help of Olaf, the Viking force hatched a plan to bring down the English Empire. Queen Emma of Normandy, the second wife of King Ethelred, was an intelligent lady, 
and she tried to protect the empire from a foreign attack, but the combined forces of the Vikings achieved what they wanted. The fall of the London Bridge marked the defeat of the English forces. King Edmund was defeated, but King Canute finally decided not to kill him as the young king had a good reputation among the Saxon nobility, and Canute needed their support. Canute married Emma, and together with Edmund, they started governing the English Empire. Jarl Kura and his motive to kill Freydis The ruler of Kattegat, Estrid Hakon, had taken a liking for Freydis. Estrid had noticed that Freydis' faith was very strong. She wanted Freydis to travel to Uppsala and seek her destiny. She had a deep-rooted feeling that Freydis was meant for greatness. Uppsala was the most sacred site for the pagans, and Estrid wanted Freydis to pay a visit as soon as possible, because she knew that there was a chance the animosity between the two religious groups might lead to its destruction. Freydis reached Uppsala where she was made to perform a ritual by the priests. She was given a drink, after which she started hallucinating. In her visions, she saw an old man, who was probably a pagan soothsayer, and he said that she was the last daughter of Uppsala, who carried the sword. The priests gave Freydis a sword, and when she encountered Jarl on her journey back, she understood the piece of metal held great significance. Jarl Kure had told Freydis to go back to Kattegat and inform Estrid that he was coming for them. He went to Uppsala as he wanted to meet the Old One, the Soothsayer, and know for himself it was his cross that carried the sword or Freydis's. The Old Soothsayer told him what he had told Freydis, and that ended up provoking a vengeful Kare. He destroyed Uppsala and killed all the priests and pilgrims present there. Later, Jarl and Olaf joined forces to achieve their common goal, which is to kill all the pagans in Kattegat and turn it into a Christian land. Kure wanted to ethnically cleanse the place, and for that, he knew he needed to kill the last daughter of Uppsala, who was none other than Freydis. Swain Folkbeard attacks Olaf in Kattegat. Kure attacked Kattegat with all his might, and after killing Estrid Hakon, he finally came face to face with Freydis. Jarl always believed that the girl would be no match for him, but he was proved wrong the moment he entered into combat with her. Freydis killed Kare and severed his head from his body. Meanwhile, Olaf, who had been waiting on the sidelines, attacked once he saw that Kare's army had done the required damage. Because of his cunning plan, Olaf was able to take over Kattegat without a single casualty. Olaf was hailed as the king of Norway, but his happiness was short-lived. Sven Folkbeard, who was ruling on behalf of his son, King Canute, came to know where Queen Elfkifu had stationed the fleet of ships. Olaf had made a deal with the queen earlier, and he was quite certain that she wouldn't let anybody use it against him. However, Folkbeard reached the shores of Kattegat and seeing such a huge fleet, Olaf's men abandoned him to save their lives. Harald and Freydis were able to save their lives. They knew that they had to go into hiding and once again strategize to gain some leverage. Leif was alive, but the death of the love of his life, Liv, had left him deranged and vengeful. Sven Folkbeard, Queen Emma and King Edmund sat on the English throne, and they waited for King Canute to return from the battle. Coming to Season 2 The second season of Vikings Valhalla continued the story from where Season 1 ended. Throughout the season, it followed the story of four major characters. Harald, Leif, Freydis, and Queen Emma, in three different locations who had been trying to achieve their respective goals. So let's get into the recap. Leif, Harald, and Freydis escape Kattegat. At the beginning of the second season of the show, Sven Folkbeard decided not to execute Olaf Haraldsson, as he had planned something else. Sven was leaving Kattegat to go and help his son in the battle. He wanted somebody loyal to be by the side of the young prince, though he couldn't find anybody to trust. So he gave Olaf an offer wherein he would have to take care of his grandson if he wanted his son Magnus to be the king of Norway one day. Olaf knew that availing of the offer that Folkbeard made had many benefits, with the most alluring one being that he could once again hunt Freydis and Harald. Olaf took Svein under his wing and started teaching him how to become a fierce warrior. Olaf had announced a bounty on the head of his brother in the hope that somebody would bring in some vital intel that would lead him to Harald and Freydis. Leif Eriksson was in Kattegat when Olaf publicly announced Harald and Freydis as enemies of the state. He kept a close eye on the movements of Olaf, as he knew that when the time came, he would have to save his sister and his friend. Olaf finally found them, and it felt like it would be the end of the trio. But out of nowhere, Jorindor from Jomsburg arrived at the scene with his fleet of boats, and he bombarded the beach, making sure that Olaf just stood there like a bystander and saw them escaping right in front of his eyes. Emma suspects Godwin's intentions. 
Emma was being told by Earl Goodwin time and again that her life was in danger. She didn't believe him until somebody tried to murder her when she was in the church offering her prayers. Godwin was able to catch the perpetrator and he tortured him to the extent that nobody had imagined. The hired assassin told him that he operated alone and was from Northumbria. He was paid by someone in the south, whom he referred to by the pseudonym Bear. Godwin assured Emma that he would get to the root of the problem and find out the real mastermind behind the plan. But before he could do so, the assassin was killed by someone in the cell. To Emma, it all felt very convenient, and she started suspecting Godwin's intentions, who until then had posed as the loyal servant of the crown. Godwin was going to marry Aelfwin, who was Queen Emma's maid, but before he could do so, Emma came to know that the assassin who had tried to kill her was Aelfwin's half-brother. At this point, Emma was very sure that Godwin was orchestrating the entire thing, but she didn't have any substantial proof to support her beliefs. Emma took Aelfwin into her custody, and she tortured her till the poor soul died. Before dying, Aelfwin said one thing, Godwin always wanted his son to be king one day. Emma found it weird because it wouldn't be possible to do that if he married a maid. She started feeling guilty about the fact that she had murdered an innocent girl. Meanwhile, Agna found out that Godwin had paid a huge sum of money to a man from Sussex named John Barr. Emma and Agna both went to Sussex, where they got in touch with an alewife who said that even after Godwin's family lost everything, the bear stayed loyal to him. The bear's real name was John Fletcher, and he had been Godwin's guardian since the time he lost his parents. When Agnar and Emma went to Fletcher's house, they found him dead. There was no sign of a wound, so it could have been possible that he died from natural causes. Emma was once again left stranded, and when she came back, she realized that King Canute had returned after defeating the Wends in Denmark. Canute offered the hand of his niece, Keitha, to Godwin, as not only did he find him to be a suitable match for the girl, but he also felt that he had not been treated fairly after dedicatedly serving the crown for so many years. Emma speculated that maybe that was Godwin's entire plan. Maybe he wanted Emma to kill Aelfwin so that he could gain the sympathy of Canute. Godwin wanted his son to be the king one day, and now, after marrying Keitha, a royal blood, he had a genuine chance of fulfilling his dream. Leif and Harald reached Constantinople. Harald, along with Leif, arrived in Novgorod as he needed money to raise an army to get what was rightfully his, that is the throne of Norway, which was wrongfully taken away from him by his brother, Olaf. However, Harald's uncle, Grand Prince Yaroslav the Wise, refused to help as he didn't want to get in direct conflict with Olaf. It was the reason why Harald convinced Leif to go to Constantinople with him, where he would sell some furs exports to arrange money. But the journey from Novgorod to Constantinople was extremely dangerous. There was a constant threat of the nomadic warriors, the Pechenegs, attacking their boat. And in addition to that, the terrain also posed a lot of challenges from the crew on board. Kuria, the blind prisoner, suggested that they should move their sled off the river channel and let the water pass. But Harald wanted to keep pushing through as he knew that they were near the lake, which was free of ice. And once they reached there, they could easily reach their destination. That was a wrong move, and it cost them the life of the crew member Vitomir. Nobody knew until that moment that Elena was Vitomir's daughter. He was scared to let the others know Elena's identity. Elena always wore a locket, which she said was worth the entire kingdom of Novgorod. She confined in Harald and told him that once when she was young, raiders invaded Chud, and to stop them, her father had travelled all the way to Constantinople to negotiate with the emperor. In return for peace, Vitomir offered to pay a huge tribute, and the locket that Elena wore was a part of it. But that was not the entire truth, and Harald had no clue about the secrets that were going to be revealed to him in Constantinople. After the crew got rid of the Varangians, they finally encountered the feared nomadic tribe, the Pechenegs. After taking the boat down the waterfall, the crew got scattered, and before they could regroup, the Pechenegs finally arrived on the shores and took Harald into custody. The tribe was divided into many factions according to the region they lived in, and after Meriam told Kuria that the people who took Harald were wearing something white and red, he knew that they were not from his brother's clan. Kuria's brother Khan was a feared leader, and he knew that Khan would do anything to get an opportunity to finish what he had started years ago. Kuria devised a plan to save Harald by putting his life in jeopardy. Leif went to the encampment where Harald was being held, and he told the Pechenegg leader that he would kill Kuria if they didn't leave his friend. The Pechenegg leader sent his men to inform Khan that his brother was in their custody. Meanwhile, Leif, Harald and Kuria were able to escape with the help of other crew members. 
Kurya had some old scores to settle with his brother, and he also knew that somebody had to buy time so that the others could run. Kurya had a poisonous powder that Maryam had given him and asked him to use with caution. He had used it to take revenge on his brother Khan, killing him with it. The Pechenegs caught Kuria and Leaf shot an arrow from a distance so that his friend would die before being further tortured. When the crew finally reached Constantinople, Harold realized that the treasure that Vitomir wanted to give to the emperor was not the locket, but his daughter Elena. Elena married the king and became the new empress of Constantinople. Harold felt deceived, and he could not bear the pain of losing a loved one yet again. But Elena had to make the sacrifice to fulfill her father's promise to maintain peace and prosperity between the nations. While leaving, she secretly told Harold that she had the utmost faith in his abilities and that nothing was out of his reach if he set his eyes upon them. Freydis kills Olaf in Jomsburg. After meeting Harker and Gudrid, Freydis thought all her problems would come to an end. But soon, she realized that reality was not what it seemed to be. Harker was not a good man, and though he claimed that his mission was to save the innocent pagans from the ruthless Christian fanatics, he was no different from them. Freydis treated everyone equally, and she believed that if she wanted to build a pilgrimage like Uppsala, she would have to be fair and just. She believed that if they all believed in the same god, there couldn't be any sort of discrimination. This caused a conflict between Harker and Freydis, where the former tried his level best to kill her and take her son from her. His hypocrisy was exposed, and Jorunder played a key role in it while helping Freydis as much as he could. Jorunder had to pay the price, and after severing his hand, he was abandoned on a boat in the middle of nowhere. Freydis came back and took what was hers. The people of Jomsburg also realized that Harikir was not worthy of leading them, and they killed him by pelting stones at him. Olaf had a lucky breakthrough when he found Jorunder lying on a boat while he was trying to locate the hidden settlement of the pagans, that was Jomsburg. He had been told when he was in Novgorod that Freydis and Harald had separated their ways. And though he had realized that it was not feasible for him to travel all the way to Constantinople, he believed that he could surely go to Jomsburg and destroy one of the last holdouts of the pagans. Before leaving Novgorod, a priest had given him his blessings, and Olaf was once again assured that whatever he was doing was righteous. The anti-pagan sentiment was the sole reason why Olaf's disdainful actions were being validated time and again by society. There was a general belief that if pagans were allowed to thrive, it would be detrimental to the Christian community. The beliefs of the people in Vikings Valhalla Season 2 were as unfounded and baseless as they are in our contemporary world. But as we all know from our real-world experiences, it is the most difficult thing to make a person believe that he must not be threatened just because somebody comes from a culturally different background. When Olaf rescued Jorunder from an abandoned boat, the latter didn't know that evil Harikar had been killed by the people of Jomsburg. Through Jorunder, Olaf found out that Freydis had given birth to a boy, and now he had one more reason to kill her. Olaf had always wanted his son Magnus to sit on the throne of Norway, and he knew that Harald and Freydis' son could pose a threat, as he was also a contender for the throne. Jorunder told Olaf everything about Jomsburg's defences and how the fortress could be breached. Freydis saw Olaf's ship stationed at a distance, and she ordered her men to launch an attack. But to her astonishment, Olaf knew the range of her sentinels. Freydis realized that Jorunder must have told him everything, as he didn't know that Harikar was already dead. Before the war, Freydis decided that under the pretext of reconciliation, she would meet Olaf and seize the opportunity to inform Jorunder about what had happened after he was banished from Jomsburg. Jorunder got to know that Harikar was dead and his mother, Gudrid, created a distraction for everybody by calling him a traitor and secretly passing him a message from Freydis without anyone noticing. He knew what he had to do in order to save his pagan land. Jorunder led a part of the army to the Sentinels and told Olaf to take his fleet of ships and attack from the harbour. He sacrificed his life to protect his people, but he also made sure that Olaf's soldiers were ambushed by the pagans and killed. When Olaf reached the harbour, he realised that it was a trap set up by Freydis. The fleet was burned to ashes, and Olaf was killed by Freydis in a deadly combat. In his last few moments, Olaf took solace in the fact that he would be called a martyr by the world for having given his life for fighting for his religion. But Freydis broke his imaginary bubble and told him that she would make sure that nobody survived to tell the narrative to the world. Freydis returns to Kattegat with Svein. Olaf had brought Knut's son Svein to Jomsburg to teach him a few tactics about the battlefield. But Freydis knew what Knut would have done if she had harmed his son, which was why she protected the lad until the very end and finally escorted him back to Kattegat, where she met with Queen Elfkifu. 
Freitas wanted to make sure that the two religious groups coexisted in peace and that no innocent life would be lost henceforth. Queen Elfgifu agreed to keep her end of the promise, and the keeper of faith, Freydis, returned to Jomsburg with her people. Harald still does not have an army, and probably in Vikings Valhalla Season 3, we will see him asking the Emperor of Constantinople for the same. Even though Olaf had died, with Svein already being called the King of Norway, it could be possible that Harald would still have to fight for his rights. Vikings Valhalla Season 3 would tell us if Swine puts up a fight or if King Canute remembers his promise and asks his son to withdraw from the race. So thank you for watching this video and do share your thoughts in the comment section about the show Vikings Valhalla. Do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to get your weekly dose of cinema and series. See you in the next one and for the time being we're signing off. Bye!